Good morning from just outside Zion National Park here in Utah. Just yesterday, we put this 2024 Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness through its paces, and it did a really good job. But how is it on an epic road trip? I'm gonna load up the car, and then I'm gonna head out. According to Google Maps, that's about a 15 and a half hour drive, but I'm not going straight there. Along the way, we're gonna have some fun. So yes, I am driving away in the same vehicle that we spent all day yesterday filming. Uh, we did sand roads and off-road and a little highway. Uh, but in this video, I am gonna focus a lot on the driving, the comfort, how well this vehicle is to live with every day. Cause literally I'm gonna live with it every day for the next couple days. Uh, and then Subaru is actually letting us keep this for about six months. Uh, so we'll have lots of opportunity to do snow testing, um, hill climbs, all sorts of different fun things. I'm really looking forward to it because I, I have a good feeling about this one. I really like this vehicle. I mean, fact is I own a Crosstrek Sport with a 2.5 liter engine. I know this motor, it's a fine motor. And actually here, we're already at 4,500 feet. So we're already at elevation, which means that this engine isn't even running at its full capacity. It's starved for oxygen. So getting it back home to sea level, yeah, I'm gonna look forward to that. Obviously, between Utah and Washington State, there's a lot of really good adventure opportunities. But there's one place that I've never been that I think I have an opportunity to hit while I'm driving back in this car. And that is Craters of the Moon in Idaho. Um, my grandmother actually lives in Idaho, and I could swing by and say hi to grandma. Uh, and also see what Craters of the Moon is really like. Now, I know there's going to be some easy trails around there. I don't know how much of a, you know, how taxing it'll be on this little cross-track wilderness, but I think it is just the kind of adventure I'm looking for on this, boy, how many miles? On this basically 1,500 mile journey. I have no idea how long this journey is because <laughs> I don't know which way I'm going. I will start by heading north though, and I'm gonna head to Salt Lake City. Onto the highway. Okay. It's a couple thousand more uh, miles of this. <laughs> Man, this is spectacular here. Look at those cliffs. I'm not going to adhere to any particular format in this video. I'm basically going to record when I feel there's something I want to say, uh, but I will check in every once in a while along the route. So basically sit back, enjoy, be ready for any major time jumps because, oh yeah, they're going to happen. And uh, at some point I might get tired and I might not make any sense. So we'll see how this goes. Now, my current leg of the trip is going to have send me to a place called Cary, Idaho, which is just outside the Craters of the Moon Monument. Uh, so that's about eight hours away. Of course, we're going to have a few stops for gas. Um, so yeah, let's see. That's going to put me there at about 6.30 p.m. tonight. Okay, right before sunset. That might be nice. Wow, this is beautiful. Cowguard! Okay. Okay. So I don't know how much gas they've put in this car. Uh, right now I'm just gonna use the electronic calculator. We'll reset that. Uh, I wanna reset my Odo, my trip. Oh, I just reset my trip. And yeah, let's see what kind of MPGs we get. Now it's currently reporting that I have 330 miles remaining on my fuel tank. And the gauge is showing full. So let's see how far we can go. And then after we get a fill up, I'll start calculating based on fill ups. Oh, funny thing about the lane departure warnings on this car, they sound just like a GoPro going off. So I never know whether or not the beeps are my GoPro or the car. I actually told the engineers like that last night and they laughed and they're like, yeah, maybe we should change that. So if they do change the, that tone, yeah, you can thank me. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty empty out here. <laughs> it's 
Southern Utah. Yeah. I kind of like it, though. The rocks are especially beautiful. The mountains, very nice. How weird must it be to, like, live around mountains like this and then go somewhere else? I mean, it's like the drama of your uh, environment is just gone. And let's haul. 35, 40, 50, 55, and 60. I will tell you this, 4,500 feet is not doing this naturally aspirated four-cylinder any favors. Okay, now we're cruising on 15 north. I'm just gonna basically put it on cruise control. We got adaptive cruise control. I'm gonna turn on auto steering. Basically, the car is driving itself now. That's kind of nice. Got a whole state to blow through today, so there we go. Oh yeah, I forgot, Utah. We have 80 miles an hour as a speed limit here on the highways or the major freeways. Here we go. Kick it up. So in case you're wondering why I picked green, and I did pick this green of all the available colors for the new Cross Truck Wilderness, I basically posted on social, I'm like, hey guys, what color do you like? And uh, it was pretty abundant. Everybody liked green best. So I picked green. Thank you for that. And I think with this particular vehicle, because of all the cladding on the outside, the green just works really well. Um, also, I like that anti-reflective sticker on the hood. I think it, it just kind of makes the whole thing really come together. This is just really just a nice looking version of the Crosstrack. And with the cladding, I think there's certain colors that work and certain ones that don't. I was surprised with in person, the red looked better than I thought it would. It looked really good. Actually, so did the orange. The white, if you want to go full Stormtrooper look, that's a good choice. Black, of course, you lose all of the cladding. It doesn't have any, it's not an accent. So uh, that's nice if you're not a fan of cladding, just get black and you just have a vehicle that looks like it's a white body. Uh, and then let's see, what are some of the other colors? The blues, the geyser blue, which is the like trademark wilderness color and it's available on all the different wilderness models. It's kind of a mix between green and blue. It is not my favorite in this vehicle. Uh, it does look nice, but it's not one I would buy. Then there's the, I think, what do they call it? Emerald blue? Pretty color. I actually really like the color, but not on this car. I just don't think it works very well on this car. I think it looks much better on uh, one of the road-based cars, not, a, not one of the off-road cars. So basically that leads me to silver or green. Those two I think are my favorites. Man, this thing is smooth on the highway. Hardly any road noise on the outside. You get a little wind on the mirrors, but that just happens in pretty much all cars. It's very quiet in here, and that's one of the benefits of this new chassis. It's not only more rigid, it's also quieter on the highway. And yeah, this is, this is nice. The fact that this has mild all-terrain tires, yeah, I don't even hear them. It's just smooth. Okay, no talking, more driving. I've now been driving for 108.7 miles. Time to report mileage. Now I will be doing calculations based on refills later. Uh, right now I don't know exactly how full the tank was, so I am merely reporting what the computer is saying. And it's saying 26.5 MPGs. So you're probably saying, hey Ryan, Aren't the MPGs on this vehicle 29 according to the EPA? Well, yes, that's true. It's 29 highway and 25 city. However, I'm driving through Utah and Utah's speed limits on their freeway is 80. So this is not exactly an optimal MPG situation, uh, but I think that I'm actually pretty happy with that figure given how fast we're driving here. I did take a look at the map to see how long it would take me to get to Salt Lake City. And I think what I'm gonna do is stop in the town of Mona, uh, Utah for lunch because it's kind of in a nice spot uh, between here and there. So with the adaptive cruise control system on this car, it's actually really easy to do long distance driving uh, because basically the vehicle handles the heavy work. I basically set my target speed, hit the little steering wheel icon, so once I set that, um, I'll take my hands off just so you can see how it's centering us in the lane as we're even going around corners. 
If it gets too twisty, of course, it'll shut down. This isn't really a hands-free system, but what it does do is it does all the steering for you. So your arms basically just can relax while you're driving, which is really good for interstate travel. It really cuts down on fatigue. Um, it's really surprising what all those little adjustments over hundreds and hundreds of miles uh, can do. It actually makes driving kind of more tired. So just like cruise control gives you a chance to you know relax your legs, um, lane centering allows you to you know relax your arms, which is pretty nice. So MPGs have improved slightly um, over this last leg. I think I'm not climbing up quite so much, and I'm now looking at 27.7 MPGs according to the computer. One thing to keep in mind also is that we're over 6,000 feet of elevation, which makes it difficult for a naturally aspirated motor to breathe. If you have a turbo, obviously that compressor can help compensate for the lack of oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, but this one, actually, it's doing pretty good. I'm cruising along here on this 80 mile per hour highway, doing exactly the speed limit. Uh, and the vehicle's, you know, pretty calm. It's relaxed, it's doing 2,000, 400, 2,300 RPM. It's quiet. Yeah, I'm liking this. This is fun. Check out what we have here. It looks like a first generation Forerunner, possibly. And oh, mercy, that is a suspension mod. <laughs> it's a bit much. Dang, I bet that thing is fun, though. Thirty minutes away from lunch in Mona. I mean, passing power is okay in the car. It's not great, but it definitely definitely has plenty enough of oomph to be able to get past around vehicles that are moving slowly. Um, of course, you know, like I was saying, it's penalized based on altitude. That doesn't help. Uh, but you know, no real complaints here. For the money, I think that this engine is just fine. Would I prefer a turbo? Yeah. But then you're adding complexity, you're adding cost, and what, what would you pay 40 grand for a, a Subaru Crosstrek? I don't know if people would. At least not enough of them. Okay, exiting into the town of Mona. does not look very big. Ugh. I always like when there's cattle guards when you get off the freeway. Find the nearest fast food place. One option is Mel's and Backstreet Burgers on South Main Street in Mona. Mel's. Sure, one. let's do Mel's. How do I get to Mel's? I think I see it. Let's do that. Oh, maybe that's Mount Nebu. That's tall. <laughs> that's that's a mountain. Okay. Sneaky mountain. Oh, there we go. Mel's Burgers Fries open. Sure, let's do that. I have to say, uh, Mel's, I think it's called Mel's Restaurant or Mel's Burgers or whatever. BLT, really good. Okay, looking for Mona Pole Road. Where is that? Looking for Mona Pole Road, and there it is. Actually, it's called 2300 North is the actual road. Wow, that is a big mountain. Now on the charts, it looks like it goes all the way up to 12,000 feet, roughly. Um, the big one on the right, uh, the one on the left, I think only goes up to about 11,000 feet. And we're gonna take a road that basically goes right up it. Um, the entire loop would take several hours. I don't really have that. So I'm just gonna try to get up to a nice viewpoint, call it good, and then get back on the highway and head north. And also, I need to note that I don't have a ton of gas. I'm just below a half tank, which shows that, according to the computer here, it gives me 200 miles of range. Oh, this is the road. Okay. 
road goes this way. This is why I really like driving vehicles that are good on the highway, but then also can do some, you know, light off-roading, is it really gives you an opportunity to kind of experience an area a little bit more than just passing through. Like, I'm gonna go up that mountain. I wanna see what that mountain's like. If I was driving a Prius, yeah, I probably wouldn't do that. Okay, this looks like the trailhead and to the right, it starts to get more challenging. Now I'll have to be really careful because I mean, these are trail tires. They're not rugged, heavy duty off-road tires. It is quite possible that I could get a puncture on one of these sharp rocks, and the rocks do look pretty pointy here. This is definitely different terrain than what we had out near Zion, that's for sure. Gosh, it looks like they just carved this out of a gravel pit. Very rocky. We do have a spare tire, but it is a temporary spare. And I don't really want to drive all the way back to Washington State with a temporary. So we've got to be super careful here. In fact, I might... Uh, let's see how this goes. I might drop pressure if these rocks continue to be this jagged. So far, I'm just cruising along in regular mode. No reason to put X mode on yet. We'll go up and then we go down. Actually, I think I'll take this opportunity to air down a little bit. Do a compromise air down. Maybe just go down to about a little above 20. So I don't always air down on trails, but these rocks are very jagged and sharp, and I just have so much more of a journey ahead of me, I just don't want to risk it. So I'm going to air them down a little bit. Of course, these tires are Yokohama Geolander All Terrains, so they're the G015 model, and they are peak rated for snow, which is nice. They're a 225-60 R17, and I actually really like this wheel design. I think it looks great. So the idea here is that you're basically uh, deflating the balloon. Uh, like, just like a fully inflated balloon, if you prick it, it'll pop easier. Uh, same thing with tires. So I'm deflating it so that it's gonna have a little more elasticity in the sidewall. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Now, if I look at the gauge cluster here, I can go to my TPMS report. It looks like everything is around 20 PSI. Ooh. Gotta keep track of time, because I wanna make sure that I don't um, get stuck up here after dark. And I have plenty of time to get back to town and get on our way. That's a, that's a pretty steep drop, by the way. So the, the Subaru Crosstrek here has 9.3 inches of ground clearance. And yes, it does have a skid plate on the front, but it's very small. I don't honestly think it's gonna save any kind of major impacts. Oh, let's see where I'm gonna put the wheel. Let's put it right there on that rock. Oh, there's some, oh, hey, starting to slip. Time to put on X mode, I think. Yep, let's... looks like I have to do a little trail improvement here. Because uh, that's more than 9.3 inches. Okay. If I start huffing and puffing, it's because we're going up to 12,000 feet. Obviously, we're going, not going that high, but we started at 6, so... This might be like seven, maybe eight, I don't know. It's tiring, that's what it is. Okay, rock out of the way. Oxygen depleted. On we go. Whew. So I'm gonna turn on X mode. Whew. I would prefer a dedicated X mode button instead of having to go into the screen. Okay, so I'm in snow dirt mode, which should make for more aggressive wheel locking as I continue to progress up this very rocky road. Once we get moving here, yeah, we got this. Oh, 
awesome looking rocks. Oof, this is rough. Pretty confident though we can get up it. The biggest issue is if there's gonna be a big boulder that's simply too large to get past in the way. I'm also gonna try to avoid any uh, pinstriping on the side. Steady throttle, slow and steady, doing about five miles an hour, maybe four and three, between three and five. Okay, it's getting a little narrow here with the uh, trees and branches. This is where having a small vehicle is really beneficial. Uh, obviously something like a GMC Denali, yeah, this would, we would have had to turn around back there or completely sacrificed our paint job, one or the other. Hug the inside here. Now the way X mode works is that with symmetrical all wheel drive, it actually does detect the surface and it makes adjustments and it has to learn the surface. So keeping throttle going and keeping movement forward actually makes the system much more effective. If you stop completely, like we often do for testing, it has to relearn. But I think it's kind of fascinating to see how fast it can relearn in those conditions. Uh, so right here, I am just keeping it steady and it is doing an amazing job. This is a very, very difficult trail. This is about as hard as I think a Subaru owner would probably attempt in most cases. But with 9.3 inches, we're doing pretty good but I still don't want to go too fast because we don't have any real underbody protection on this thing. Just that little strip of aluminum in the front, which I already dented yesterday. <laughs> Just a little dent. Hmm, is that right? 9.3 inches. Do I want to bet it is? I think it'll actually tip over when we hit it. Hmm, didn't hit it. Up oh, there it goes. <laughs> Ooh, boulders, okay. This is becoming technical now. It's where approach, break over, all of that comes into play. And I'm glad I aired down. Oop, oop, oop. Come on, keep that traction going. This is surprisingly difficult right there. Okay, there we go. We're moving, we're moving. It just detected uh, object in front of me, so that's always fun. Oof. This is very loose and very big boulders. So I'm not stopping. Man, this is this is really incredible that this little cross track can get up this stuff. Oh, oh, come on. Come on. Come on, feeling that X mode kicking in hard. If you haven't watched any of our other videos on X mode, uh, there's the two different types of X mode, snow dirt and then deep snow mud. Deep snow mud actually adds additional wheel spin. It actually uh, you know, spins the wheels more so it reduces traction control to give you more momentum going through difficult objects like mud or deep snow. Uh, the first level just turns on the system to be um, more aggressive in wheel braking, shifting it left to right. You still get some wheel spin, of course, because it's based on that technology, but it is very aggressive in shifting that power. More aggressive than many other vehicles in this category. Subaru says it's because they've overbuilt their system to be able to deal with the shock to the system of the power transfer. Um, in my experience, that seems to hold true. There's a little turnaround spot. Good, we got a few of those. Oh my gosh, we got more rocks here. Okay, let's not damage the frame on the first day here. Let's keep it moving, keep it moving, keep it moving. Whoop, 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 we're getting it, we're getting it. You know what I'm shocked with? How little undercarriage I'm hitting. I've hit, what, one rock this whole trip? That is pretty amazing. Of course, that'll change now that I actually called it out. Oh, yep, we've got some big pointy ones right here that are huge boulders planted in the ground. Maybe do a little pinstriping on the right. Yeah. Okay, there we 
go up and over. Another turnaround spot possibly, that's good. Okay, moving on. Wow, we are burning through gas actually. Our MPGs have dropped dramatically and we're down to a quarter tank. But the good news is it's all downhill when we're done. So I could just roll down technically. It's like dirt, first dirt I've seen in a while. <laughs> Collision detected, always. Oh, we're on dirt now. Oh, this is nice. <laughs> Watch the pinstriping still, of course. Yeah, a little striping on the side there. Rain has definitely changed. I feel like I'm kind of more in the forest now, not on a ravine. Edge of a ravine. Oh, this is pretty. I'm like in a little aspen grove. Huh. Oh, an opening. I haven't had an opening in a while. Aspen grove clearing. Nice. Well, this is spectacular. This is a very high valley. It's really cool. I think we'll stop here, turn around, and then head back. But let's uh, get out and take a quick look. Glacier up there, aspens around there, beautiful grasses. It's like it's not real, right? This is amazing. Hate to say it, but I gotta turn around and go back because I gotta get back on the road. When I uh, engage X mode, it automatically enables hill descent control, which is actually really useful on a road like this, where it's very steep and very slippery. I don't want to roll on the rocks. So when I keep my foot on the throttle, it'll keep the speed that I'm rolling at, uh, put my foot on the brake, stop completely, release it, and it'll start easing me at the slowest speed it can, which is about two miles per hour. Now, one thing that is new on this cross track wilderness is it grabs immediately no longer historically there's like a five foot roll before uh, the um, hill descent control kicks in this one it's immediate it's like probably an eighth of a turn on the wheel uh, which is much 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 better than the old hill descent control just easing it down so I drove up at about about three miles per hour. I'm going down about three miles per hour. There are some big rocks here. I actually just passed a family who are on a quad uh, and they looked at me like, what? Stop chatted with the gentleman who was riding, uh, driving it. And uh, he said, you came up in that? I said, yes, yes I did. <laughs> and now I'm going down. <laughs> well, it's gonna be this for the next hour or so. Uh, let's just go ahead and fast forward, assuming this all goes fine, and uh, we'll pick up with me on the highway. I am back on the freeway. I put gas in the car, I aired up the tires, and I even found a car wash, so it's clean, kind of. Now, in terms of damage, what happened on that route? Because it was a very, very rocky climb. Well, there's definitely a couple scratches on the wheels, and there apparently a twig or something reached out and grabbed right by the headlight. But overall, I'd say that it's pretty normal for the type of adventure we just did. And the fact that this vehicle got up that climb, and as I was coming down, all the people on their quads going, what the heck? You have this car out here? What are you thinking? Well, it just tells me that this car is very capable. And man, that was a beautiful feel. That was definitely worth the side adventure. Well, now I'm pressing on to Idaho. Um, not sure how long it'll take to get there. Nav says it's gonna be about five hours or so. Uh, so yeah, I guess gonna 
put it on adaptive cruise control with lane centering, turn that on, kick back, and drive. So I've just been driving along here. It's now been almost 78 miles since I filled up the tank. And I just noticed I'm averaging 29 miles to the gallon according to the computer here. Now, my driving has been much slower than the first leg when I was getting a lower MPG. Uh, but it's interesting, I've been doing a lot of stop and go, which usually isn't very good for MPGs. Yet here I am getting the actual highway estimated MPGs, which is great. Um, I'm averaging between 70, 75 miles per hour, which is definitely slower than 80. And that difference seems to really make an improvement in the MPGs. This gets such good range uh, because it's now calculating that my total tank to empty is about 350 miles. And I still have 178 miles to get my to my hotel tonight, at which point it will be very dark. So I'm not gonna film at that point. Uh, in fact, the sun's go, kind of going down now. It'll be sunset in probably about an hour. Um, but man, been driving all day, still comfortable. Looking forward to another adventure tomorrow. And uh, we're going to continue this drive. <laughs> uh, but at this point, I think we're going to probably fade to black and pick up with tomorrow. Good morning, and you might notice this is no longer a highway. That's right, I'm taking a uh, shortcut um, up to the Valley of the Moon here in southern Idaho. And I decided to go through some uh, Bureau of Land Management land, and this road is awesome. <laughs> of course, last night I did find a hotel, I had a good night's sleep, and then woke up this morning and filled up the tank of this car, and I did calculate the mileage from that last highway trek. And because we were doing, you know, the speed limit posted was 80 miles an hour. Plus on top of that, there was some stop and go. Uh, so I was averaging 23 miles to the gallon. So there is a penalty of course, with having uh, extra ground clearance and also having um, all-terrain tires. It's telling me my pressure is low. Oh, cause it's so cold out. My pressure temperature has, my pressure, tire pressures have dropped because uh, yeah, we're all the way down to 28 now on all corners simply because it's rather cold out and that's actually pretty good because uh, This is really rough and having a little softer tire isn't so bad So that worked out The route here is going to take us uh, basically Over roads like this for the next hour roughly I do have to look for these mud pits to make sure that I don't bottom out uh, between tire grooves and I also have to look for errant rocks and trenches because of course this is not really that well maintained it is just for access into uh, the property and it's going to switch between a lot of rocks some washboard some gravel mud and really really hard mud I guess that would just be called dirt but you know what I mean like these bypasses. Gotta watch these bypasses. The bypasses really test clearance here. So far, the car's doing fantastic. So good on the highway. Really good on roads like this. I mean, you know, if I'm going to find fault with this vehicle, I think it's mostly a visual thing. Like, some people aren't going to like the cladding. Just, it is what it is. Um, also, you know, at this price point, a front camera, they should have done it. Um, other things I'd like to see added to it are like a crawl control function. That would be neat. Um, but the improvements in the hill descent control system, uh, improvements in the safety systems, I mean, they really have evolved the product, uh, making it even better. I, I see no missteps here um, in terms of the product that is offered. And of course, yeah, the tires could be more aggressive, but this is a great balance for a lot of buyers. Not everybody needs a KO2, right? Okay. 
Oh yeah, this is great. Man, this, this suspension is pretty good. Now you could argue that the vehicle needs adaptive suspension so it really loosen up on this hard stuff, but I would argue that that just adds unnecessary complexity. Um, I think that this default springing and damping is just right in there. I mean, it's perfect. It's so smooth on even this rough stuff, uh, yet it's fairly compliant on the highway, right? You're just not gonna get that corners on rails feeling uh, that you get with a WRX and that's okay. This is actually way more comfortable. And I was also thinking of altering the finish line for this video. Originally I just said Seattle, but I'm not actually going to Seattle. I don't even live in Seattle. I live out on the peninsula. Uh, but I'm thinking that a good finish line for this will actually be our off-road test course, uh, which is near Ellensburg, Washington. That will definitely uh, be a good place to stop this and then start an off-road test course video. You get a two for one. And for those of you asking, hey, does this guy ever shave? Uh, actually, I landed and I had forgotten my razor on my last trip. And I decided, you know what? No razor, no problem. I'm just going to be shaggy until I get to the last day of this video. So uh, yeah, you're still shaggy. A little salt and pepper going on there. Not gonna keep it though. there is still some deep mud around here uh, simply because these puddles can't all be bypassed although this one can so let's bypass it uh, and the main <laughs> and for those of you watching saying run through the puddle I, I'm kind of with you on that but this kind of mud there's different types of dirt different types of mud uh, this mud is very very sticky and slippery if I get stuck I have no way of recovering out here because I am by myself um, and uh, yeah, don't want to have to deal with that. That would really mess up my schedule. But if you do have to go through some of those mud things, and I have had to go through a couple of them, um, you just want to keep a steady throttle as you go to, uh, no lifting, uh, keep it moving. And if in doubt, use X mode deep mud, because uh, that'll help keep the wheels spinning while still applying braking uh, to keep you moving forward. So it's, that's a good thing. That's a good, perfectly acceptable time to use X mode. So I am heading to a national monument called Craters of the Moon here in Southeast Idaho. I've never been there, but I have flown over it. So this is officially flyover country. Um, I have flown over it in airplanes and I'm like, that looks really cool. So I wanna at least drive by it and kind of see what it looks like from the surface. And this road actually goes right in between uh, sections of the Craters of the Moon. So. I expect the terrain will get rockier at some point. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what nature holds for us here. Got to watch for these errant rocks. Lots well, of birds out too. Now that we've actually hit some pretty smooth gravel roads here, uh, ooh, some surprising rocks in the middle, um, I can talk about driving fast on gravel roads. So uh, never overdrive what your capabilities are and constantly scan the road for uh, things that might cause problems like rocks, uh, branches, wildlife, that kind of stuff. Um, you don't want to brake while you're going into the corner. You want to brake before the corner and then you want to throttle through the corner. What that does is basically when you're about to go into the corner, if you put the brakes on, it puts all the weight onto the front of the vehicle. If you throttle, it puts the weight on the back of the vehicle and that affects your grip. So if I come into a corner and I slam my brake on and then twist it, it's gonna kick that back out a little bit because all the weight is on the front wheels. There's nothing over the back. Uh, that's one way to actually create a rotation if you want to do that. Uh, but if you're trying to stay 
level and flat, then you don't want to do that. So just keep in mind that the balance is actually very important in the handling of a vehicle, especially when on a loose surface like gravel. And the same thing actually applies to snow. So these tires are actually really good in these conditions. I feel like I have adequate control. I'm not going to say grip because it's gravel. You just don't have a lot of grip. Everything's roly-poly. Uh, but I feel like I can actually drive pretty briskly here. And then when I have a blind crest, I definitely slow down because I don't know what's on the other side. And then I go into the corner, add a little throttle, and the Subaru shifts that power to the back, and boom, out of the hole we pop. It is such a fun car to drive. And really, this vehicle, it has the feel of a little rally car right out of the box. You don't need to set up anything with it uh, to go out and have some fun. Now, again, I want to emphasize never overdrive your capabilities. Never go beyond um, you know, what, you're, what you consider to be safe. And I consider this speed to be pretty safe for me because I have hundreds of thousands of miles of driving roads just like this. Um, but yeah, this thing, this thing is super fun. And it's quiet too. And the suspension is great. I mean, really, this car is blowing me away. I thought it would be basically a Crosstrek Sport with a little extra ground clearance and a lot of body cladding. I was wrong. This car is very different from this standard Crosstrek, and I love it. It is. It takes everything that's good with the Crosstrek and just basically makes it better, and pretty significantly so. If you're gonna use it as a commuter car in this, occasionally go to a trailhead, obviously just stick to the regular Crosstrek. But if you crave adventure and long roads and you wanna take the shortcut and avoid the highway, this Crosstrek will get you to places you may not have been able to get to before. Watch sprocks around the corners. We're starting to get towards uh, craters of the moon, so the rocks here are uh, more plentiful on the route. So it'll be smooth, 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 and then boom, granite right in the middle of the road. Uh, actually, I don't know if it's granite, but some big piece of rock. So I gotta watch for those. If I clip one of those with these tires, then uh, I'm walking. <laughs> don't wanna do that. I mean, I'm not walking. I do have a spare tire in the back. It's just that it's not a uh, exact swap. So I'd have to get out, swap a tire. That's no fun. Yeah, those guys are sharp looking. Looks like we're almost up to the actual monument here, or at least close to the monument. Making good progress, making good time. Onward. I have to put in a word about the stability control on this vehicle. I am just driving with normal stability control right now, and I think it's actually really nice. I can feel what the vehicle is doing before it becomes too intrusive. I'm not like coming into a corner and then having traction control clamp me down and then cause me to like understeer off the side, like right there. I just had a little bit of sh balance in the back shift out. I can feel what the car is doing, but I never really get in over my head. Of course, if you make aggressive enough of movements, you can always uh, counter any safety systems, especially if you're flying upside down. So again, caveat, be careful. Be careful, be careful. These rocks are starting to get really big on the sides. Um, slide into one of those and boom, that cladding ain't gonna help at all. got into Montana yet but it should be coming up here real shortly. Endless rolling hills out here. Eastern Idaho is uh, pretty sparsely populated. Yeah, not a lot going on over here. Ugh, so many bugs on my windshield. I need to find a car wash at some point. I want to spray the mud off so it doesn't damage the paint. Can't leave that on too long. 
Well, that's a cool bridge. What's that going on over there? Oh, uh, rail crossing bridge, that's why. Now entering the Continental Divide, elevation 6,870 feet, Montana. So let's see, been driving uh, to 11, about four and a half, maybe five hours, and uh, still comfortable, doing good. I do want to get lunch though, and there's a spot that looks pretty good coming up. It's called the Old Schoolhouse Cafe in Dell, Montana. I don't know. I don't really know where I am. Let's give it a try. Town of Dell, population 35, elevation 6,007 feet. And uh, that is where I'm going to eat some lunch. For trains, okay. Oh, this will be perfect. touch. Cash only? Yeah, I can do that. Like a bowl of chili to go with you for lunch later? <laughs> well, the people in Dell seem very nice, very chatty. Although getting lunch slash breakfast did eat a lot of my time up. And the only reason I'm really in a hurry is I'm trying to meet dinner with my grandma at 5 p.m. in Coeur d'Alene. Oh, and then of course I mentioned to one family member that I was actually going to be going through Coeur d'Alene to go meet my grandmother and now the whole family wants to get together, which is great. Happy to see them, but it was like, oh. Eh, scheduling. I should have scheduled more time in Coeur d'Alene, clearly. Now we're finally getting some landscape that looks a little bit more like Montana. Craggy rocks rising up from the valley. Love it. Look at that one on the left there. Just actually all these rock formations just look amazing. Finally, jumping onto I-90 here, which will take me all the way west. But first, I have a stop in Missoula to have coffee with my nephew. Still feeling pretty comfortable. This thing is really just a road trip warrior. It is really nice. Yeah, trying to find some flaws here. Not finding any, really. I mean, not without, like, constructing something ridiculous like you know the whole adaptive suspension or whatever but other than the things I've already mentioned yeah this is uh, this is good stuff and floor it come on now apparently I'll be sitting in traffic for a while in Montana. I think one thing that really surprises me about this vehicle is just how quiet and composed it is at high speeds. I mean, that long stretch back there was 80 miles, well, it was posted as 80 miles an hour, uh, and it was a brisk jaunt. <laughs> and uh, the vehicle felt really planted on the ground. It was very quiet. There was very little road and or wind noise. It's just, it's such a kind of a premium driving experience for a vehicle that is this small and, you know, from Subaru, not from like Lexus or Mercedes or anything like that. I'm, I'm just, I mean, I've driven a ton of Subarus, but I am still very impressed by this little car. It's flooring me. It really is. I was hoping to hit a car wash, but it looks like I might not need to because it started to rain just as I'm outside Missoula. Nice. 
Although this isn't nearly hard enough. I need a real downpour to get the mud off of this thing. If the rain gets harder, we'll see how these all-terrain tires deal with wet cement on the highway. That's nice. Boy, we're discovering so much about this vehicle on this trip. The Japanese have a term called, I think it's, ugh, I'm going to butcher this, jemba atai, something like that, which means horse and rider as one. And Mazda uses it to describe the experience that you get when you drive a Miata. And I say they're right. I mean, very few cars have that kind of horse and rider as one feeling as a Miata. Of course, a Miata is only about the size of a horse, so that helps. But this car right here, I think, is the first time that I've driven a crossover and kind of got a Jumba, a Thai, Jumba, anyway, get the whole horse and rider as one thing with a crossover. And typically, I think the issue is the way most crossovers handle uh, and all the compromises that they make. Now, granted, this isn't a horse and rider as one as though going around, you know, Laguna Seca racetrack. No, but this is in everyday circumstances. I feel like the seat just really fits me well. I feel like I understand where all the wheels are and my clearances. I mean, this is a boxer motor, so you can only do so much with the approach angle because um, the motor kind of hangs out there and it's mounted pretty low, which of course helps with handling, uh, but it causes problems for approach. But like on the first day of this road trip, I hit that rocky climb no issues. I literally only had two bonks on the underside of this vehicle, and those were some very big rocks. It was a very steep climb, but the reason I didn't have any issues is because when picking a line, I felt like I really understood where this vehicle was and what it could do. That is rare. That is very rare, especially in today's world where you're so reliant on sensors and cameras and just everything to get you through complicated situations. This one, it just felt like, like an extension of myself climbing up that hill and even today bombing through the valley there in South Idaho. Driving down the gravel briskly, I really felt like I had a lot more control in this vehicle than I usually do in a crossover. Usually you're kind of fighting with the crossover because it wants to really understeer into corners and the tires just can't really deal with gravel that well. But this one, again, it just does. And I'm kind of shocked that it does both of those things so well. I mean, you definitely get that whole off-roady, you know where everything is feeling with a Jeep Wrangler. But put a Jeep Wrangler on the highway and it's not a great experience. Heck, put it on a gravel road at speed, not a great experience. This one, it just does all of these things so well. This vehicle, I still think you should consider it if the size works for you because it really is just, it's really great. It really is. And I'm gonna ruminate on that a little bit more because we're not quite done yet. We have to get out of Montana, back into Idaho, and over to our off-road test site uh, in central Washington before we really wrap this up. So I'm gonna ruminate on that idea with this car as I continue with my journey. But right now I'm exiting here in Missoula to go meet up with my nephew and get some coffee because it's definitely coffee o'clock. Okay, so just had pie and coffee with my nephew. Uh, I was at Break Espresso uh, and I had the mixed berry pie. It was quite good. Although note to the proprietor, would have been better with ice cream. Pie is always better with ice cream. But <laughs> the pie itself, quite good. And actually the coffee was pretty good too. Okay, now I'm gonna get back into the CarPlay system here. We're gonna get maps up. And now it's time to find our way to Coeur d'Alene. Rain clouds have definitely moved in, so let's go ahead and open this up, get a little more light on the subject. Right, moving on in the rain now, heading on I-90 westbound towards Coeur d'Alene. Uh, let me kind of just wrap up, I guess, my thoughts for today. The dirt road was, it was amazing. Honestly, driving this car really gave me the feeling of, you know, I think the first time I drove a WRX on gravel and you're like, wow, this thing is amazing. It can do so many things. But the thing about this car is that 
it's because the suspension is softer, it's also really smooth, especially on that really rough stuff I was on early on in the day. And with the extra ground clearance, you just don't have to worry about uh, rocks or even ruts quite so much as you do other Subarus uh, or other cars for that matter, because uh, nothing else in this class has 9.3 inches of ground clearance, nothing. And if you don't have a ground clearance, you just simply can't get through stuff. Ground clearance helps going through mud, it helps dirt, it helps rocks, it helps even in the snow because if you get into compact ice and snow and the rut in the middle is too big, you're not going anywhere. So Subaru going up to 9.3 inches with this Crosstrek, I think that is a massive win. And the adjustments they did to the suspension, the combination with the tires and these wheels, uh, giving a nice sidewall to it, I think that you know Subaru really has made something special here. I think the only real things where I'm like, ah, Subaru, could you do a little bit better? And I'm, I kind of don't want to say one of them. Uh, the front camera, that's one. I'm just going to keep talking about that and talking and talking and talking. But the other one, it's the MPGs. I have been averaging about 23 MPG on the freeway. Now, I have to say though, there is a huge asterisk next to that. So don't just say, oh, the car gets 23 miles to gallon, what a piece of crap, because it, it doesn't. This is at like over 80 miles an hour because Montana and Idaho, their speed limits are fast. And a vehicle like this, when you have an engine that has not quite as much horsepower, it has to struggle more to get up to speed, especially when you're pushing through wind. It was a little bit windy in Montana earlier. I was getting buffeted around a bit and you're fighting your way through that. It's physics. Um, and with as much horsepower as this has, it has to struggle a bit more at higher speeds. It just does. So, I, you know, for the capability, I will trade the 23 MPGs when driving on 80 mile per hour freeways. I think that's actually okay. Uh, earlier yesterday when I was driving lower speeds, I got as high as 29 MPG on the freeway, which is amazing. Uh, that was a lot slower and it was a little stop and go. Uh, and then of course off-road, well, you just throw it all out the window because nothing gets good MPGs off-road because you're constantly on and off throttle and typically you're climbing or descending. I mean, if you compare it to Heck, I'm just going to compare it to my Ranger Tremor, which has literally twice the horsepower of this thing. <laughs> uh, that gets about 17 miles to the gallon. So this is a huge step up <laughs> in, in regards to that. And in fact, if you compare this against other more purpose-focused uh, off-roaders, it actually is really amazing on MPGs. But then again, if MPGs are your thing, don't get the Wilderness Trip. Just get a regular Crosstrek or... Better yet, just get an Impreza. Uh, and those actually have really good MPGs considering they're full-time all-wheel drive. So you don't have to go with this car, but if you do go with this car, you can't really stab it with that MPG thing because there's gotta be a little give and take. I do think it would fare better in MPGs at high speeds if it had a little bit more power, but then it would suffer with MPGs at lower speeds because it would be more of a gas guzzler. So again, everything is a compromise, especially in the compact crossover class. And I think that this car, even those caveats included, is probably one of the least compromised, off-road ready, compact crossovers. That's where I'm right now. It's also super comfortable for road trips. It handles great on both gravel and on pavement. I'm cruising in the rain now at 80 miles per hour because that's the speed limit here. And I feel 100% confident with these tires, with the suspension, with the car, the way it drives, the way it tracks, the safety features. I love it. I really do. So if you're gonna poke holes in this and say, oh, I should have adaptive suspension or it should have all these other things that are way more expensive, would add to the cost, maybe make it competitive with one or two other things. But for the most part, those are way more expensive anyway. I mean, what are you gonna compare this against? The turbocharged Jeep Compass? I mean, that has some things going for it, but I'd take this over that any day, even with the new 2.7 turbo in the Compass. And then how about comparing this against like the Bronco Sport from Ford? Size-wise, it's a very close competitor, 
boxy shape wise it kind of more competes with the Forester but I think when you're regarding wheelbase and overall size it's pretty squarely in here now granted you can pay ten thousand dollars more for a Bronco Sport if you want a turbocharged engine and a front view camera there's always a cost attached to it and so I'll put the question out to you would you pay forty five thousand dollars for a turbocharged Crosstrek Wilderness with a front camera because I'm guessing that's probably what it would cost. I might be wrong. Maybe they could find some economy of scale there that brings the price down, but you know what? It ain't going to be cheap. And for the money that they charge for this thing, I think you're getting a fantastic deal, very capable compact crossover. But I'm not quite done yet. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today because all I'm doing now is driving in the rain uh, to Coeur d'Alene. Oh, that rhymed. That's nice. Uh, tomorrow, we'll pick this back up again as I blaze across uh, eastern Washington and head to our off-road test course where we'll start another episode and end this one. So here we are on our final day of this journey. I just got the car washed again. The weather today should be pretty clear, I think. We've got an almost full moon in the sky still. That's pretty neat. Hello, moon. I always like getting a clean car again, you know? I love getting cars muddy, but just something about having a car that's clean just feels better. It's almost like when you're walking around all filthy, but you're also walking around people. <laughs> Same thing. Car is filthy. When I'm by myself, that's cool. When I'm in the woods, wilderness, whatever, fantastic. When I'm on the freeway, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a little dirty. I should probably clean it. Luckily, there was a decent car wash over there in Coeur d'Alene. Visited grandma, she's doing great. Uh, she originally had a lifetime goal of outliving the Queen of England because they were the same age. Well, she successfully did that, so now she's aiming for 100. Time to uh, turn on the adaptive cruise, get that lane centering enabled, and we're just gonna roll. This is all very, very, um, not that exciting of a section. We're gonna go through Spokane, we're going to go through a lot of Farming Valley, and then we're going to get to Allensburg. And that's where the fun will begin. And this video ends. <laughs> and I'm finally in my home state of Washington. <sighs> it's nice to be back. One thing that's going to be significantly different on this leg of the trip is that I'm going to be much closer to sea level. Uh, whereas the first parts of this trip I was at what does I do? 6,000, 4,000, and 8,000 feet. Uh, this leg is all at about 2,000 feet, which it does not significantly affect engine performance. 8,000 feet? Yeah, that is significant. So here we should be getting better performance from this 2.5 liter. So right now, this is the medical lake area just outside of Spokane, and there was a huge forest fire. It's pretty incredible. I mean, the way the fire was selective and there's certain areas that are absolutely raised, but then other sections where the trees look completely fine. A lot of people lost their homes. We definitely lost a lot of forest. It was pretty brutal. Something that I just love about Washington state, which yes, is my home state. I'm a little partial, <laughs> is the diversification of the environments. I mean, you have everything from the lush Puget Sound and then you go over the mountains and it's all like, high desert. I mean, this is all at about 2,000 feet. And as you go more north, it becomes way more remote, way more rugged, um, a lot more exposed rock. But large sections of this are rolling grasslands and farmlands. It's just really kind of a beautiful thing about this state. It's just how it, it all kind of works together, but it's all very different. Right now, I'm just cruising along I-90 here. Uh, this is, of course, the major way to get back to Seattle uh, from Idaho. The drive today is relatively short. We only have about three and a half hours of total driving uh, before getting to the test hill. Uh, so it's actually a pretty chill day as far as, the you know, compared to the other days on this adventure. Now that we're at 2,000 feet, I'm going to go ahead and pull off here and get a refill on my gas tank just so that I'm add a level and we'll do a calculated refill later to kind of see what the MPGs are real world here. 
a high, in a non-high altitude situation. I think I might get some coffee while I'm here too. Filled it up. Just gonna kind of reset the trip. So trip B, reset. Okay, now let's see what kind of MPGs we get at 2,000 feet of elevation on a relatively smooth level highway. And we're also gonna be traveling at about 70 miles an hour, unlike earlier when in Idaho, <laughs> doing 80, uh, which, you know, aerodynamics can be a bit of a challenge. Anyway, so I'm not gonna baby the throttle, but I am gonna try to maintain a pretty steady pace. I'm just gonna engage cruise control once I get on the highway here. And we're gonna see what, you know, cruising along at 70 miles per hour gets me for MPGs. And uh, I'll report the MPGs that we have up on the gauge. Um, and then also I'll calculate uh, once we get to Ellensburg with another refill. Okay. Obviously MPGs are gonna go down because I'm throttling in. I have to say though, this engine definitely feels peppier at 2,000 feet compared to 8,000 feet. Altitude is not its friend. Okay, already I'm going too fast. Let's ease it back in. I'm just gonna hit 70 miles an hour, the speed limit. Set adaptive cruise to 70, auto steer, and we're golden. Let's do this. I've now been driving for just under an hour. I've done 60 miles, and so far I've averaged, according to the onboard computer, 27 MPGs, which I don't think is really that bad. Now, we are at about a thousand foot elevation. That's where most of this part of the state is. Uh, and it's not exactly level. It's a lot of rolling hills. So there's a little uphill, a little downhill, uh, but I think overall the result's pretty good. Now it is a little bit off from the optimal 29 miles to the gallon. Um, I'm thinking that if you did the Seattle to Portland run, which is pretty much level the whole way, and also uh, is 65 instead of 70, I think you might be able to get 29. Now, one thing that also makes this run more efficient than my earlier runs is I actually have proper air pressure in the tires now. Um, I was able to finally find an air compressor that works properly. <laughs> so some of those earlier tests I did in the same video, um, my air pressure was down to around 28, 29, which is on the low side, and that can hurt MPGs. Combine that with the 80 mile per hour speed limits, and you're just not gonna be terribly efficient. So now we're about to dip into the Columbia Gorge, which is always very exciting for me uh, because it means we're about halfway across the state and very close to our off-road test site. And we're heading down into the Columbia River Gorge now. This is such a cool area. We use it uh, for hydroelectric. There's a big dam up there and several more dams over there. I think we should play a game. Let's see if I can hold my breath across the length of the Columbia River. <laughs> Let's see, there's the bridge deck. Whew, prep myself. <clears throat> okay, I think I'm ready here. And three, two, one. <sighs> okay, success. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, the town of Vantage, and the neat thing about this is there's actually some like dinosaur stuff right over there. So if you're into dinosaurs, this is the place to go, clearly. Uh, we also have huge wind farms just around the corner up here. And in the distance there, I can finally see Mount Rainier, 
Mount Rainier is, of course, on the west side of the state. I mean, it's part of the Cascades, but it's basically on the other side. So that's a just, it's just nice to see it, you know? It means I'm home again. Of course, I got to get to the other side of it to get home, but we're not doing that right now. Right now, we're heading to the Driving Sports Test Mountain. Test Hill, still working on that name. Anyway, our mountain test course, uh, which is just outside Ellensburg, and we're almost there. That climb out of the gorge, though, was a real killer on our MPGs. Uh, the computer's now reporting 25.6 miles to the gallon. And part of the reason is because on the other side of the gorge, we are at about 1,000 feet of elevation. Right here, we're over 2,000 feet. So it was, a, it was a heck of a climb out. Almost time to turn off the freeway. Finally, we'll be done with the freeway leg of this journey. That was, uh, that was a lot of freeway driving. But overall, I have found this car to be very comfortable. I, I would have no problem jumping in this car again tomorrow and driving to the East Coast. It's that good of a road tripper. Um, and which is kind of surprising. Typically, smaller cars are less comfortable. They make more noise. The seats aren't as good. Um, the functionality of the stuff in the cabin, usually not as good. But in this case, I feel like I have everything. And this head unit, no errors, no bugs, no reboots, nothing weird, which is shocking if you know the history of Subaru and their infotainment systems. They've been a bit glitchy over the years. This one, absolutely perfect. I'm astonished, I really am. And I like the vertical with the big Apple CarPlay. It's just a nice tablet. Uh, when I first used it and for the first few years, wasn't terribly excited by it. I don't think I'm still excited by it, but I have no problem with it. And I think it's a very functional, good system. I still would prefer buttons for aircon and whatnot, but I'll get over it. Okay, let's get off here and check the fuel and see what our MPGs are looking like. Um, on the gauge, I actually got back to 27 MPGs after that steep climb out of the gorge. Um, <laughs> but I wonder what the calculated range will be. So we have 117 miles here. Let's find a gas station. Uh, let's go to that one. Okay, let's see what this did. on the click. Okay, clicked. So we're at 4.3 gallons. Okay, so just filled up 4.3 gallons and we'll do the math times one, or divided by 117.3. Oh, 27.27 miles to the gallon. So the computer was actually very accurate. That's nice. Well, we've learned something. Uh, make sure to keep your tire pressures in the right spot. Drive slower than 80 miles an hour. And if you want the best economy, don't get the wilderness, just get a regular cross track. Uh, if you want capability, yeah, wilderness. With that, let's go to our mountain test course and wrap this road trip up. <music> So that's the end of our 1200 mile journey. Let me sum up my thoughts about this cross track wilderness for 2024. First off, on the highway, very nice car, very pleasant to drive, it's comfortable, it's quiet. Even though it does have mild all terrain tires, they don't really generate a lot of noise and they provide ample traction even in wet weather. On that mountain climb in Utah, this little thing acted like a goat. It just climbed and climbed and climbed. X mode worked fantastic, even over very difficult terrain. Now, the boulders I was going over were quite large, but still, because of very effective approach and departure on this thing, I didn't have any problems getting up. Uh, sure, it had to scramble a little bit, but ultimately, I knew it would make it. Coming back down, the improved hill descent control system worked like a charm. Uh, it actually made hill descent a little bit easier because all I had to worry about was when I wanted to come to a complete stop, it really helped ease me down even over that very rocky, rumbly terrain. And I didn't hit anything on the underside, which is remarkable uh, given how rough that terrain was. Fuel economy, 
uh, peaked out at about 27 mpg on this last stretch here, which was probably the only pseudoscientific test that we did. Um, I think given the capability of this vehicle, I think that's acceptable. If you want more miles to the gallon, then just get a regular cross track if that's your priority. If having adventures is your priority, then this obviously is a better choice. There are a few things that I would like to see improve still. Uh, the lane detect noise, little beep, 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 sounds exactly like a GoPro turning on. Kind of annoying when you're filming with a GoPro. The chimes for no seatbelt, super annoying. Even if I'm in park, it still chimes the alarm, which I think is absolutely absurd. I'm not moving. Why is it warning me to put my seatbelt on? That makes no sense. The adaptive cruise control and lane centering systems worked great, which made my entire trip just way more relaxing. I expected that I would like this vehicle pretty good, but it actually blew me away with just how nice it was to drive on the highway. Plus, it is even more capable than I thought it would be. So overall, I was very impressed with this new 2024 Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness. If you're considering a Crosstrek and you want a little bit more capability, this is obviously a good choice. Likewise, if you're considering something like the Bronco Sport or even a Wrangler, but you don't want to do rock crawling, then this might also be a good option. And if you're also considering, of course, the Jeep Compass Trailhawk with the turbo engine, I would suggest taking a look at this. Even though you will be way down in horsepower, I still think it is fast enough to still be fun and it is very capable. If you enjoyed this video and you're interested in this cross truck wilderness, I have some good news. Subaru is loaning this to us till next spring, so we have a lot of videos coming up. And in fact, I'm gonna start filming one as soon as we wrap this video. That's right, we're at our mountain test course in central Washington, where I'm gonna put it through all of the courses. That's coming up, so you definitely wanna subscribe. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthit. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again right here.